Paul. I'm Claude King on Growing Disciples, and today I'd like to tell you the story of the Moravian Revival. Much of the story comes from this little book, Power from on High, by John Greenfield. In 1727, a group of about 300 religious refugees had gathered on the estate of Nicholas von Zinzendorf. They came from a variety of religious traditions. Uh, many of them were from Moravia, uh, and were spiritually descendants of John Huss, who was burned at the stake for his faith. There were Lutherans, there were some Calvinists, and from the Reformed tradition there were followers of Zwingli, some Anabaptists, and other sects that were represented there, and they had differences of opinion and uh, interpretation of Scripture, and consequently there was great conflict in the community. Zinzendorf, the owner of the estate, realized that they were going to destroy the community unless something was done. He resigned all of his government responsibilities so he could attend to shepherding this flock of people. He and the three elders of the community drew up a covenant of brotherly love and they went person to person and asked them to enter into this covenant the way they would relate to one another. And on May the 12th, wholeheartedly the entire community entered into covenant together and they began to experience a dimension of joy and unity that summer that they had not known. On August the 10th, uh, the Lutheran pastor said, On Wednesday I'd like for us to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, but since we've not partaken of the Lord's Supper since our birthday, I'd like for you to spend the next three days in special and more strict preparation as we get ready for the Lord's Supper. As he was concluding the service that day, he fell on his knees weeping as he cried out to the Lord in behalf of his people. And uh, that turned into a prayer meeting that went till after midnight that night. The people took seriously the call to prepare, and over the course of the next few days, they uh, carefully examined their relationship with the Lord and with one another and sought to get those things right. On Tuesday of that week, a couple of people even got saved as they realized that they didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. As they gathered at the Lord's Supper on Wednesday, August the 13th, they began to get their focus on the wounded Savior and on what Jesus had done for them. The scripture says we love him because he first loved us and he laid down his life for us. And somehow, as they got their focus on Jesus and what he had done for them on the cross, they fell in love with the Savior. Something happened in that community. And coming out of that experience, they began a 24-hour prayer meeting. Uh, 24 men, 24 women agreed to pray, and they drew lots to assign the hours. And so every hour there was at least one man and one woman praying 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That later became known as the 100-year prayer meeting because it continued unabated for over 100 years as the people prayed for God's kingdom work to be accomplished not only in their own area but throughout the earth. Another thing that came out of that experience, they began to have a heart like God's for a lost world and they began to pray for missions and for the lost people around the world. They'd heard the testimony of an escaped slave from the West Indies and he told of the plight of the Negro slaves and how desperately they needed to hear the gospel. As the community prayed, two young men sensed God was calling them to go. And as they prayed, though, they were told that because of the slave owners, they wouldn't have access to the gospel. Leonard Dober and Tobias Leopold came to sense that God was calling them to go and that they must sell themselves into slavery in order to preach the gospel. Zinzendorf thought, that's too high a price to pay, I can't let you go. But they kept insisting, God has called us. And so they gathered the community together to pray, and they drew lots. The lot came down that Leonard Dober was to go, Tobias Leopold was to wait. But they didn't want to send Leonard all alone, so they prayed, and they sensed God wanted David Nietzman to go with him. The two set off to Copenhagen to get on a, a boat on their way to St. Thomas Island. When they got to St. Thomas, though, they found out that uh, they actually could preach the gospel to the slaves. And so they became carpenters and earned their own living in order to preach the gospel to the Negro slaves. That began the missionary work of the Moravian Church. 
Uh, they began to share testimonies of what God was doing. Missionaries began to go to other places around, around the globe. A group of those missionaries were on their way to Georgia when a great storm arose. There was another man on that boat named John Wesley. And in the midst of the storm, uh, Wesley noted that he and the Englishmen were crying out in fear, thinking they were going to die. But these Moravian Christians were praying and singing hymns. And he realized there's something about their faith that I don't have. He was a failure in Savannah, Georgia, and Wesley went back to London, England. He hunted up a Moravian missionary there named Peter Bowler and began to talk to him about his faith. And it was at a Moravian chapel at Aldersgate that John Wesley says he was strangely warmed and feel, filled. Uh, Wesley was converted because of the faith of these Moravian missionaries. John Wesley was one of God's chosen instruments to lead the evangelical awakening in England and the first great awakening in the United States. And tens of thousands of people came to faith in Christ because this one man was touched by the life he saw in the Moravian Christians. Another person was deeply impacted by this group of missionaries. Uh, they would send reports back so the intercessors would know how to pray for the mission's work. And there was a cobbler outside of London, England, that began to read those reports and pray. His name was William Carey. Uh, William Carey began to develop a burden for the heathen in foreign lands. Uh, we claim him as the father of modern-day missions, and yet it was the testimony of these Moravian missionaries that inspired him to follow a similar path and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Uh, what could God do with us today if he had people who were in love with him the way the Moravians were in love with him? God took those 300 religious refugees and over the course of the coming years, over 125 of them went to the mission field, but they uh, changed their world. What would happen if 300 people today were to so fall in love with the Savior, they would be willing to lay down their lives for the cause of Christ. My prayer is that God will revive his church in our day would you ask God to revive your church so that you can be his instrument to carry the light of the gospel to your own community and to the ends of the earth? Let's pray toward that end. What would happen if uh, not only 300 people, but 300 churches were to fall in love with Jesus like that? Or 300 communities or cities that would fall in love with Christ like that? If God's people were to love the Lord the way the Moravian brethren loved the Lord. We'd see the gospel spread throughout the earth quickly, and we'd bring to completion the assignment Christ has given us to carry the gospel message to the ends of the earth. Let's pray toward that end and seek the Lord together.